Good morning. Welcome to week number two in our ongoing study of the book of Revelation. I'm Pastor Dodge, and this is Awake Us Now. It's a beautiful morning here in Michigan. My prayer is that God will bring great beauty into each one of our lives today through this powerful word in this amazing book. We're going to start with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive in. Would you join with me, please? Heavenly Father, we bless and praise your holy name. We honor you, the God of the universe. We rejoice in you, the God of our salvation. We thank you for your incredible gift of Jesus, our Savior, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for divine wisdom from above. And we pray this day that your Holy Spirit would speak into each one of our hearts and minds. May we grow not only in knowledge, Lord, may we grow in wisdom. May we grow in our knowledge of you and our wisdom of your purpose and plan. We pray that in all things you would be honored and that we would be blessed. And we pray that in the name of Jesus, our Messiah and our returning King. Amen. Amen. Well, it is so good to be with you this morning, and uh, we're going to be continuing our study of the book of Revelation, but I'd like to start with a personal story. You see, it was about 52 years ago that my life was forever changed, and here's how it happened. I attempted to win a political argument by proving that Jesus would have supported my politics, and so as a high school student, I started reading the New Testament. It changed my life. It is the reason that today I am a pastor instead of a retired fighter pilot. My plan was to go to the Air Force Academy, but God changed that as I read the New Testament. It is an incredibly powerful book, and it speaks directly to our minds and our souls. And today we're going to be looking at one of the books of the New Testament that is perhaps the most perplexing, not just in the New Testament, but in the entire Bible. And yet it is a powerful testimony about the goodness and graciousness of God, about the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ, and about what is to come. And so today we continue with our study of Revelation. I'd like to just remind you, actually, I'd like to share a little bit more of the story. See, over the years in reading the scriptures, um, I've learned a lot. God teaches us through his word. He, he opens our minds to see things. Some of the things that I've seen in the scripture are just mind-blowing. Others are minor, but some of those minor things I've never forgotten. And here's an example. You see, when I went away to college, I was so excited to be able to study the Greek New Testament, to learn ancient Greek, and to read through the Bible with scholars and to grow in my understanding of Scripture. I still remember my first New Testament class as a freshman college student. I was so excited to get into that class we were going to be studying the Bible, and uh, I actually pulled out in preparation for today's class the textbook that we used almost 50 years ago, the New Testament Speaks. And, and looking through it, it brought smiles to my face because I saw all the underlinings and all of the notes along the side. But there's one thing that I vividly remember from that class, and that is a pop quiz that the prof gave us. He told us, write out all the books of the New Testament in their proper order. And I'll be honest with you, I was feeling pretty good about that. I knew them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, so on. Yeah. I got my paper back the next class and I had one marked wrong. One point taken off, I got a 99 instead of the 100 I was anticipating. <laughs> and here it is. I wrote down revelations as the last book of the New Testament and the last book of the Bible. And the prof put a big red mark through the S and wrote minus one in red ink next to it. I've never forgotten it. It's a small thing, but you know, 
I've found over the years, I'm not the only one who's made that mistake. And so I just mentioned it at the outset so that as we talk about this book, we use the proper title. It's the book of Revelation, not Revelations. It contains Revelations, <laughs> but it's the book of Revelation. Now, last week, we had been talking about various ways this book has been interpreted over the centuries. We, we mentioned four in particular that have been widely held by very devout believers and disciples of Jesus. In fact, many devout disciples and followers of Jesus have argued bitterly with one another over how to interpret this book. And last week, I shared with you something that I believe we really ought to consider. And that is that God is brilliant and that even though you can make strong arguments for each one of these particular methods of interpretation, what if God is far smarter than we human beings think we are? <laughs> that ought to be obvious, by the way. What if the Lord intentionally arranged this book so that in every age, in the first century, in the 21st century, in the year 1000 and the year 1517, it applied to the events that were going on then. God truly is brilliant. And this book, as perplexing as it may seem, and, and as mysterious as it sometimes seems, with all of the numbers, with the strange figures, with various kind of animals and beasts, with remarkable scenes that are hard to imagine, what if... God intentionally organized this book in such a way so that in every age, his people would be encouraged, strengthened, drawn to him, receive through a repentant spirit, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and acknowledge Jesus for whom he really is. Our savior, our Lord, God in human flesh who came down to give his life for us all and who has risen from the grave and who is coming back. I believe those things are true. I believe that is the proclamation of the New Testament. And I believe that we can learn a great deal from each of these interpretations of this book. As we do that, I would call your attention to something rather interesting about the book. There are 22 chapters in our book of Revelation. Now, please note, when the Apostle John wrote down these words from Jesus and from the angel, he did not begin by writing chapter 1, verse 1. Those numbers were added much later. In fact, the numbers that we have in our Bible, the chapter numbers and verses, were actually added by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, in the early 1200s A.D., but they're very helpful for us as we kind of look at the book and, and seek to find various parts of it. It really does help you navigate through the book. But one thing that stands out is that individuals who hold to these four various interpretations of the book of Revelation are almost unanimous in agreement on how to interpret the first three chapters. And I see that as a very positive sign. They recognize this is a book that was initially addressed to a group of believers living in what we today call Western Turkey in the first century. And uh, these are followers of Jesus who first received what we are going to be studying. Almost all students of scripture acknowledge that those three chapters, uh, they're pretty straightforward. And, and we're going to see they are powerful chapters as well. It's in the middle of the book that we have so many disagreements. And so what I would like to do today is start with the thing on which everyone is agreed, and that is the opening words of the book of Revelation. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 1. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you, by the way, to, uh, to have your Bible with you and uh, would invite you to to uh, follow along as we read these words together. This is what we read in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God, 
and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, many times people are tempted to read over the opening words of a book of the Bible. Uh, oftentimes the attitude is, well, I want to get to the good stories. But there is so much here in these opening words. In these first two verses, we learn so much. And God is speaking to us in some very powerful ways. First of all, he says, this is the revelation from Jesus Christ. In other words, this book is coming from Jesus himself. It is a book that Jesus intended for his children to receive. It contains letters from Jesus to early believers. You know, many people have commented that, well, how come Jesus never wrote a book of the Bible? He did write chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation because they contain letters from him. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, or as the NIV uh, translators have it, the revelation from Jesus Christ. It, it's very clear that this is coming from Jesus himself. But even this word revelation is a revelation. Do you know what the original word was that John used? John wrote in Greek. And uh, here is the word that he used. It's the Greek word apocalypsis, from which we get the English word apocalypse. Now, when you hear that word apocalypse, what immediately comes to mind? <laughs> For many people, it's warfare, destruction, the end of all things. But in reality, this is a very positive word. The word apocalypsis literally means an unveiling, a revealing, a revelation. God here, through our Lord Jesus Christ, is revealing things that you and I need to know and need to apply to our lives. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ himself, and he is unveiling things here. Now, I know that sounds counterintuitive, because when many people think of the book of Revelation, or as it's sometimes called the apocalypse, they automatically tend to think of confusing things, perplexing things, things that people have disagreed on over the centuries. You know, you can get three believers together in a single room and have five different opinions, that kind of thing. But in reality, as complex as this book is, and as unusual as it is, it really is an unveiling of the purposes and plan of God. And that's what we are going to see as we work our way through this powerful and life-changing book. Well, in Revelation 1, verses 1 and 2, we read that this is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show whom? His servants. That is the word that the Bible so often uses for followers of Jesus. You know, it's interesting. When we talk about people who are quote-unquote Christian today, we often use the words believer and Christian. Those words are hardly ever used in the New Testament. The words that are most commonly used for followers of Jesus in the New Testament, including here in the book of Revelation, the words that are most commonly used are the words servants, literally bond slaves, one who is totally committed to, uh, to his master, servants and disciples. Those are the words that, that the Bible uses primarily. In fact, it appears that it was non-believing people who coined the word Christian. Those words were first used, we're told in the book of Acts, in the city of Antioch in Syria. And it appears that it was a title that was basically developed by non-believing people. It literally means a Christer, one who's always, you know, talking about Christ. But the Bible speaks in terms of us as his servants and his disciples. And so here in the opening words of this powerful book, we read about the revelation, the unveiling from Jesus, which God gave him to show his servants, his disciples, what must soon take place. He made it known how? By sending his angel to his servant, John. 
In other words, John did not compose this on his own. And if you're asking the question, who is John? That's a great question to ask. As best we can tell, both from the internal evidence of the book and from the writings of earliest believers, this John is none other than Jesus' best friend. John, the son of Zebedee, the apostle John, who is also the author of the Gospel of John and the first and second and third epistles of John. John was a prolific author. He was a dedicated follower of Jesus. But what he writes here is not something that he developed on his own. Instead, we are told in these opening words that God sent his angel to John. And as we will see later on, Jesus himself spoke to John and communicated what we are going to be reading here. As a result, John, Jesus' best friend and disciple, is the one who testifies to everything he saw. John gives us a clear testimony of what God revealed to him, what the angel communicated, what Jesus said, what he saw in these profound visions. John tells us and testifies to everything he saw, even that which is confusing to us. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This book is above all else about Jesus. It is above all else about the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It reveals God to us. The book continues then with verse 3. John writes, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. If ever you wanted a reason to study the book of Revelation, verse 3 is a real good reason, isn't it? Because those who read this, and isn't it interesting, it says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. For us, that sounds kind of strange because in the English world today, English speaking world, we, we tend to read silently. We're taught in school, don't move your lips while you read. (laughs) In the ancient world, that wasn't the case. You see, in the ancient world, they did not have spaces between words. Everything was written, all compacted together. And as a result, when ancient people read, they read out loud because they had to sound things out to make sure they were breaking the words at the proper points. It was a rare individual who was able to read silently. And in the ancient world, people read out loud. And so here now, God himself is saying, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it. Note it doesn't stop there. Uh, So often in our culture today, we talk about, well, I heard it. You know, I I have to admit, I've been embarrassed on a number of occasions when Jan has said something to me and I kind of nodded my head and then later had to ask her, what was it that you really said? (laughs) You know, oftentimes we hear and don't internalize it. God doesn't want that in your life and in mine. He wants us not only to hear his word, but to take to heart what is written here. In other words, to apply what we learn That is so critical for us in this world today, because today, especially in the Western world, there is a tendency to talk about the Christian faith without really living it. God's intent was never that we turn the Christian faith merely into a bunch of head knowledge so that you can answer trivia questions about the Bible. God's intent is that we be changed by his word. That's one of the reasons I started with the story I did this morning. That word changed me. It changed my life. And it has had an impact on my life ever since. That word is a powerful word. About 10 years ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to me in my mind and simply said this. You need to be in my word like never before. You need to let it wash over your soul. Up until that time, I was always trying to read the Bible through once a year. After that, 
I ramped things up. And in the last 10 plus years, I've now read this thing an additional 73 times. The more I read it, the more it speaks into my heart, the more that becomes obvious. And God is saying to us, blessed are those who not only hear it, but take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. You do not have to be a seminary professor to look at what is going on in the world today and say, whoa, I think we're getting close to the times that Jesus spoke of. It is clear the end is near, the time is short, and the Lord is calling us to take him seriously and take his word to heart. So as we go through the book of Revelation, we're not going to go through it simply at an academic level. We're going to go through it at a heart level. We will talk about things that are academic, no doubt about it, but we are going to focus on things that are life-changing. And so as we continue to move in this book, I bring another point before you because it's going to be helpful as we try to sort things out in these coming weeks. I've already mentioned to you that most interpreters are agreed on the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. It's in the middle that the differences occur. But everything changes when we get to the last three chapters. And all of a sudden, those who are preterists, historicists, futurists, and uh, individuals who believe in a more spiritualistic interpretation, all of a sudden, they no longer emphasize their various interpretations of the whole book. They concentrate on how do you interpret the last three chapters. And admittedly, those last three are some of the most perplexing in all the Bible. At one level, they're very straightforward. God wins. <laughs> that, 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 that pretty much sums it up. But chapter 20 in particular introduces something that is found nowhere else in all of the Bible. And that is what's known as the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. And it's here that there have been so many disagreements among believers over the centuries. And so I'd like to focus on that for just a moment here this morning, because I believe it's going to be helpful for us as we move forward in our study of this entire book. Over the centuries, there have been four basic views or interpretations of the last three chapters of the book of Revelation. Uh, the titles that are, and terms that are used for them are lengthy and confusing. Uh, you know, you've got to practice speaking these things in a mirror to get them down right. But here are the four views. One is known as historic premillennialism. And by the way, pre means before, millennium means a thousand years, and ism means ism. Uh, historic premillennialism is those who believe that Jesus is going to come back before the thousand year reign. That's historic premillennialism. And that is the view that was widely held among early believers. It's not the only view that was held, but from what has survived from the 100s, for instance, uh, most of what has survived basically reflects this particular view of the end times, that Jesus will come back and then reign on the earth for a thousand years. A second view that has been widely held and has been widely held by many dedicated, committed believers, some of the most brilliant theological minds, frankly, of the last few hundred years, is a view known as post-millennialism. Post-millennialism means that Jesus will come back after the millennium, after a thousand years where the world has just gotten better and better and then Jesus returns. That view was extremely popular before World War I. In fact, in the early 1900s, 
There were many individuals who, who looked at what was happening in the world. They saw the way diseases were being cured, the way remarkable inventions were coming to light, that the invention of the airplane, the telephone, the electric light. They saw the way people were traveling around the world, the way cultures were being bonded together as never before, the way the gospel of Jesus was spreading as missionaries went out from the Western world to the rest of the world. And they said, we are on the verge of a golden age. And then came World War I, when quote unquote Christian nations went to war with one another in what was the most brutal conflict the world had ever witnessed till that time. And that pretty much destroyed post-millennialism for a while. Today, it's becoming more and more popular again. It's been held by many really committed people. The third view is amillennialism. That literally means no millennium, which is not really what an amillennialist would say. The amillennialist says the millennium, the thousand years, is a symbolic number, and it represents Christ reigning over his people until his return. This view has also been held by some of the most brilliant theological minds we have ever seen on the planet. And then finally, we come to, and this is really a mouthful, dispensational premillennialism. And dispensational premillennialism is relatively new. In fact, it can be traced back to England in the early 1800s. John Darby was one who popularized this particular view. This view, by the way, is the one that is most popular in Christian circles today dispensational premillennialism. And it maintains that Jesus will come back before the millennium, but in a secret coming. Premillennialism basically suggests that there are two returns of Jesus, one for his people and then one for everyone else. We're going to be taking a look at these in a little more detail next week, but that's kind of a brief overview of the four views of uh, many people regarding the last chapters of the book of Revelation. And it'll be very helpful for us as we move along in our study. Next week, what I'm going to do is kind of outline these various views in more detail and, and talk about the commonalities that all of them have. But what I'd like to do right now is to challenge you and me. I would like to uh, challenge you in this coming week to read the book of Revelation straight through. If you've never read it before, now's a good time to start. And if you start reading and say, well, I don't understand all of this. Well, welcome to the human race. The more we read, though, the more it takes root in our hearts. And even the things that we don't understand are overwhelmed by the things that we do understand. So I would invite you, if you've never read it before, read it this week, okay? We're not gonna have a quiz on this. I'm not gonna ask you to write out all the books of the New Testament or anything like that, but I just encourage you to do that. Uh, secondly, if you say, well, I've read it, I've read it many times even. Well, can I suggest that you try reading it in a single sitting? You know, that is a very exciting way to read any book of the Bible. So often we tend to break it up into the chapters, but as I mentioned earlier, the chapters weren't there originally. These are books that were intended to be read and read through. And, and there is something very moving about reading an entire book of the Bible at one sitting. Now, if you say, well, how long will that take? Um, somewhere in the neighborhood, depending on how fast you read, somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour and 15 minutes to two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, but it's not, that's not an impossibility. And, and if you can find that kind of time, I'd encourage you to carve it out. It is a really amazing thing to read it in a single sitting. And then if you wanna do something very powerful, read it out loud. Remember how the book begins? Blessed are those who read this out loud and listen and apply what it says. Try reading it out loud. Now that's gonna take a little more time and you'll wanna keep a glass of water nearby to keep your throat lubricated, but 
it too is a very, very life-changing experience. And I'd encourage you to give that a shot, okay? On that note, we're going to end today with a word of prayer. And uh, I invite you to join me now as we simply come before God. Lord, we thank you for the way you have revealed yourself in the scriptures. We thank you for the way you have revealed your incredible love in Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for the way your Holy Spirit reveals your truth in our hearts and minds. And we pray in these coming days that you would speak to each of us in life-changing fashion as we read these words, as we hear what you are saying, Lord. May each of us grow in faith, grow in wisdom, grow in our commitment to you as your servants and disciples. Amen.